wake up every morning not knowing what that day has in store. And sometimes that can get the best of you. And that's where people end up just quitting. I think I learned early on to just embrace that anxiety, embrace that, that anticipation, and just leverage it and turn it into energy. Um, and that way you just keep on going no matter, no matter what the obstacle or the task that those instructors throw at you for the day. Basic underwater demolition seal training, or BUDS for short, is the selection process for Navy SEALs. And it is literally just six months of getting your ass kicked, being kept cold, wet, and sandy, and never really having an opportunity to rest. The focus is first very much physical, which ends up turning into a mental game. But ultimately, it is six months of hell to see if you can endure, see if you're mentally strong enough to deal with you know, crisis and complicated scenarios to ultimately break you down mentally. That's the whole point of the whole process in the military, whether it's a, a boot camp or when you get to you know, BUDS, which is considered one of the toughest um, selections in the world. Uh, they, they break you down physically, which then inevitably breaks you down mentally and emotionally. And uh, I feel like every guy's probably got a different answer, but for me, um, the mental aspect of it was where I was strong because I was physically a 150 pound skinny runt. So all I had was this, you know? And so for me, getting through whatever the test was of the day started here and ended here where a lot of guys, you had Naval Academy athletes, you have even professional athletes that stop what they do, what they're doing to try and become a SEAL. And you're surrounded by some of the greatest athletes in the world that show up to BUDS to see if they've got what it takes. But for me, I was just a skinny little punk from Texas, but I knew that I at least had this part somewhat squared away. One of the unique things about BUDS is you are constantly kept humble, right? And so for me graduating BUDS, there was no like, ha ha, look at me, right? Look at what I did. It didn't exist because you knew like, wait, this is just the beginning. Like I got a long road ahead of me. You know, you've got to get through for me, I was a medic, so I had now I had to go get through the Army Special Operations Medical School. And I was like, holy shit, that's like one of the hardest schools in the military, mentally. I knew that I had to go through advanced SEAL training, which back then was called STT, SEAL Tactical Training. And that's where you actually learn how to be a SEAL, because you don't learn that in BUDS, right? And then I knew I've got to then check into my SEAL team and then I'm gonna be put into a platoon. And it's the platoon that decides when I get my trident. So I still had a multi-year path to go before I was actually gonna put on the symbol that represents Navy SEAL. There's always somebody more seasoned, someone smarter, faster, stronger. Always come in early, always stay late, Probably the one thing we're really good at in special operations is lessons learned, right? As soon as you get done doing something, whether it's in training or it's real world, you immediately come together and have what we call as a hot wash. And that is you remove all rank, you remove all experience, everybody gets in a room and you call each other out. Hey, you fucked up. Yeah, I know I did. Sorry about that. It won't happen again. And hey, you fucked up too. Yep, I know, okay, I'll, I'll fix that. You go around the room and there's a whiteboard. Everybody's writing down everything we, everything we all fucked up at. And then we go, okay, this is never gonna happen again. 
And it doesn't matter if you've been in for 10 years or if you're a lieutenant and I'm an E3 nothing, or it wouldn't be an E3, but an E4, E5, E6. If you're an enlisted guy or an officer, it didn't matter. You were all equal during a hot wash. You said what needed to be said. It was constructive criticism and put it all on the whiteboard, fix your shit, let's have a better day tomorrow, right? And that's how you handle it every single time. And so in a very short period of time, now everyone's operating full speed with minimal error and you treat every mission as a zero fail mission, right? And once, once that, once that momentum began, man, it was, uh, we were just, we were just dominating, you know, over and over and over again. And of course, you're still humble. You still respect the element of surprise, right? Because it happens even to the best of us. And, uh, you know, and you, you deal with those moments um, the best you can and then just keep driving for it. Don't be, don't be scared to just go and fail. I think we hear it a lot these days, but that's the reality of it is you have to go out, you know, fall on your face a couple of times um, and be willing to get up and keep moving uh, and know that nothing is going to come easy. After that, it's trial and error. For me, I have literally stumbled my way through writing books, starting a business, um, and what I try to do is just embrace the fact that whether it's a success or a failure, I'm always learning and that learning is going to allow you to get down the path of success in some form or fashion eventually. For some, it happens pretty quick and for others, it takes longer. But as long as you don't give up, then you're going to, uh, you're going to have the moment of success that you're looking for. I think self-reliance is, is, is self-reliance is something that we all inherently had at one moment in history, right? If you look at this country, it was just 200 plus years ago we were founded and everybody, man, woman, and child were very self-reliant when they did it, you know? You can't say that for today because technology has made us lazy. But I think what's made us even lazier is the lack of accountability and the lack of consequence. And so if you don't hold someone accountable for their actions and there is no consequence, then there's no reason to really be self-reliant because, well, uh, someone's either going to do it for me or, or whatever excuse I come up with will be good enough and no one's going to, no one's going to ridic ridicule me, correct me, or give me cur constructive criticism. You know what I mean? So I think, yes, you have to be accountable. Um, you have to take on and face consequence. And all of that leads to being far more self-reliant because with self-reliance comes, you know, look in the mirror and determine your vulnerabilities, determine your weaknesses and fix them. The transition is tough. Um, and I think it's, for me personally, it's ongoing every day. You know, I, uh, I have my moments when I'm like, fuck, this civilian stuff. Um, you feel like you're just not cut out for it. You know, you feel like it's, uh, it's just not, it just doesn't match the personality that, that was developed in the SEAL teams. It doesn't match your character. It doesn't match any bit of you. And uh, the whole like fake it till you make it is what comes to mind. You really try your best to, you know, embrace this whole civilian side of life. Um, and for some guys, it's more difficult than others, you know, and they'll end up turning to alcohol and drugs and God knows what else in order to just try and get through it. Um, but the reality is you just have to face it head on. But I think every guy deals with what I call going from hero to zero. I think what keeps me, well, first and foremost, when you're in the SEAL teams, you're, you're serving the greater good, right? It's not just for the United States either. It's for the globe. You know, a lot of the operations we conduct um, 
are for the greater good of the world we live in and are not specific to U.S. policy, okay? And that, that feeling of operating for the greater good is something that doesn't go away. So for me, transitioning out, I just created my own greater good, and that is providing you know, safety, security, and survival skills to both organizations and individuals. For guys that have issues, I think they should just, they gotta talk to someone. They have to create, you know, a tribe of folks, you know, it could be family, it could be friends. Um, hell, I mean, it can even be a stranger, you know, at work. Just have that moment and, and talk it out, you know. I think there's, there's all these different forms of therapy out there and, you know, I think it's important that it's okay to just go and find the one that works for you. You know, don't be shy about it because that tends to be the, uh, the problem is there's a stigma that comes with, you know, getting help or asking for help because number one, we're used to doing everything ourselves anyway. We're very independent, very capable guys. So we don't want to ask for help because that's like, oh, that's, that might be a form of weakness. Um, I'll just do it myself. But when it comes to dealing with this and your emotions, it takes other folks to kind of help you get through it. If you try and deal with it on your own, you'll go crazy. Um, and you probably won't get too far, you know. Just got to talk. You got to talk it out. Thank you so much to Clint Emerson for joining us on this video. I'm going to link his stuff in the description. Today's video was brought to you by Mulliganmurrors.com where you can now get the Not A Journal in preparation for 2023. Get them whilst they last. They are selling fast. Thank you to all the support. Follow me on Instagram at Jordan Mulliganbrother and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.